To develop a bot using shared GPT, Yeah, 
All right, uh, it's it's eight thirty, so I'm gonna get started. Yeah, so yeah, so <laughs> it's eight thirty, so I'm gonna get started. Um, yeah, so a lot of you are engineering majors, I'm guessing. <laughs> uh, electrical engineers, but I just came up with a million dollar idea that will allow you to quit this major, quit this class, and move to Tahiti or I don't know, whatever you want to do. Uh, come up with a shirt that holds the mic at the right height automatically <laughs> and just sell millions of them to uh, weirdos that don't know where to put it on. Like me. No, uh, yeah, so dropout is over. So that means I can start being mean to all of you since you just left with me. Uh, so, so I guess we'll, we'll have another syllabus day. This is the real one. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so I've had a lot of questions about quiz logistics. Um, they're, at, they're in the syllabus. So if you look at the back pages, there's a schedule of classes. And then in the classes that there is a quiz, it says quiz on it. And so those are the dates when the quizzes are. Um, homeworks are usually submitted through a quiz system on Brightspace, but those are not quizzes and those aren't graded. So um, if you submit them, good for you. If you don't, um, the reason we're not, I'm not, putting a homework grade was because in previous semesters, the homework average was near 100. The test averages were around 60. And uh, so I didn't find that homework was really effective. We've actually had semesters where there's no homework grade and the test averages haven't changed. Basically the test averages are typically the same no matter what we've done. That being said, um, the quizzes are part of your homework grade. Um, and so, like I said in the first class, the goal of these quizzes are not to uh, assess, well, they're for, for me to get feedback on how well you're doing, but they're not examinations in the sense of uh, you're expected to know it right then. So they're gonna be more forgiving. Um, they're more assessments for me to get an idea of where you are. Um, 
at this point, depending on different quizzes, the distribution of grading is, but you should expect that these quizzes, about 50% of the grade is just showing up. So if you take your quiz, you write your name on it, you turn it in, you at least got a 50. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that. So, cause this is supposed to be like a homework grade. It's not supposed to be to stress you out. It's supposed to be for me to understand whether you understood the lecture material so that when I prepare health material, I know where you all are at. Um, so just don't stress out about it. Uh, there's no stress out about the test. <laughs> Go ahead. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's going to be much more relaxed than an exam. So I'm just going to give you guys, I'm going to give you all of you uh, a piece of paper. This first test, I'm going to hand grade it and then we'll see how that goes in terms of how long it takes me. I'm hoping to hand grade all of them, but there's 110 of you. So I don't know what how much burden that would actually be realistically. Go ahead. So this is my uh, first semester doing quizzes. Um, I know last semester they did quizzes and uh, they the professors tended to like it better. The feedback I got from the TA was that students were going less to office hours. Uh, and so in that sense, homework was good because students were coming in asking for help and then, but uh, yeah, so I recommend you also do the homework, but just do the recommended problems, don't do the rest. The rest are actually quite challenging. Uh, if you want extra practice, then you can do the challenging ones, but uh, we're not grading. Go ahead. Is, it, is the content like the homework that doesn't count around grade space? Is that pretty much the same content that's going to be on Quiz Friday? No, no. Uh, it's based on mostly lectures. <laughs> yeah, you. It's going to have a combination of very basic problems and difficult problems. They're at the level of what an exam would be. Because like I said, the goal is to figure out where you all going, are going wrong before the actual exam. And so if I don't, if I give you two easy questions, then you get to the exam and then you get mad at me. And yes, yeah. question. Since it would be pretty easy for someone to work with the partner next to them, can they be partner quizzes anyway? No. <laughs> uh, I want you to work by yourself. Um, like I said, you know, at minimum 50%, I'll, I'll decide once I start grading them. Some some might just be purely attendance-based, just because I'm in a good mood. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> so if you look at actually our previous exams and some are posted, that's to the level that you should expect to put in an exam. I think that's, and they don't quite line up because we move the material site. So, so what you're going over right now is test two material. Yeah. They're based on each subsection. All right, let me get started because we already spent seven minutes and we're already behind. Uh, oh, wait, question? No? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so today we're going to go over LC circuit and RLC circuit. I combined both lectures. Uh, so whatever we don't finish today, we'll finish tomorrow before the quiz. The quiz will be 20 minutes roughly. Um, so yeah, so let me get started. So as we said last week, the, whenever you have inductors and capacitors, um, the only thing that changes from resistors is the IV relations. And so in particular, the voltage of an inductor is equal to LVDT of the current across the inductor. And the current of the capacitor is equal to C B, B, T of the voltage in the capacitor. And then we also said that because voltage of the capacitor and current of the inductor are under a derivative, these two quantities are continuous and that's what we will solve for switch circuits. So once we talked about switch circuits, then we started talking about the LC circuit, which basically is 
a circuit that doesn't uh, have any resistors. And then we set that uh, to derive an equation for the circuit, let's say for the capacitor voltage, we would again use the same rules we've been using, which are KCL and KVL. So KCL tells us that the current going through the capacitor is equal to the current going through the inductor. And then if we uh, do KVL, we have that the voltage inputted into the circuit should be equal to the voltage through the inductor plus the voltage through the capacitor. Um, and to derive at differential equation, what we did was we first uh, plugged in our IV relation for the inductor. So then we got L D D T of V L sub T plus V C sub T. Oh, not V L, sorry, I I L sub T. And then um, we can use this relationship to write I, I L sub T as the time derivative of the voltage across the capacitor. So now we end up with L D D T square square V C sub T, and then I miss the C plus V C sub T. And so that's kind of the governing equation for our LC circuit. We could have also derived this equation in terms of the inductor current. So at this point, we could have uh, written VC in terms of the inductor current using this equation. So we would have integrated both sides. And then we would have ended up with an equation that looks like this. L D D T of I L sub T plus uh, one over C, the integral from negative infinity to tau, I L of tau, D tau. Uh, so that for the left-hand side and then on the right-hand side, it would be Vn. And then what we could have done is just taken the derivative of both sides of the equation and then we would have had our differential mm -hmm. equation. So those are two alternate ways, they're equally valid. One solves for the inductor current, the other one for the capacitor voltage. Um, and then once you know either or, you can use these relations to find the other, basically. Does this make sense to everyone? Cool. So that's basically what uh, I did in the slide. So these are the governing IV relations for capacitors and inductors. This should be IC, which equals IL. Um, and then the okay, yeah, yeah. So you can use these two to get this, and then uh, I just plugged in that for VL, and then I got the same equation as before. All right. So <clears throat> as we discussed in last uh, lecture, to find the homogeneous solution, what we would do is we would basically set the left-hand side or the or the source to zero. And then we would solve the differential equation. So can anyone tell me what the characteristic equation of this is? LC lambda squared plus one equals zero. At this point, is anyone confused by this equation here or how I got this equation? Cool, all right, that's good. So that means that lambda equals plus or minus J one over the square root of LC. Um, so our, our, uh, our uh, roots are imaginary. And so that means our solutions, our homogeneous solution, homogeneous, solution will be of the form C1 e to the negative J T over square root of L C plus C2 e to the J T square root of L C. 
Now, in this particular class, we we don't want to deal with exponentials with imaginary uh, things on their exponent. And so instead of using this, we define a, a, a set of new constants, which I'm going to just call A and B, so that we can actually write our solution as sine omega t cosine omega t. And omega is just going to be equal to one over the square root of LC. So basically we're using Euler's identity to replace those exponentials with sine and cosine. And then we're changing the constant values so that we can match the two expressions. Is this making sense? So in this class, whenever you have real roots, your, hom your homogeneous solution looks like e to the negative, uh, some number or t over tau, i and some constant. When you have imaginary roots, your solution will be a sine omega t plus b cosine omega t. Um, and then whenever they are, whenever they're repeated roots, it's going to be of the form. So when the two lambdas are the same, e to the la, uh, t over tau i plus T E, uh, wait, so here, I'm just T lambda, sorry, just call it lambda here. Lambda uh, T. I'll repeat this later in the lecture, but just for now, kind of these are the three cases. And then if they're complex, you will you can also have a decaying exponential sigma T where this is the real part of that root. Mm -hmm. Question? Could there be a J before the sign for so this is the thing that I can define a constant, let's say a1 equals j b1. So it doesn't matter because when I solve my circuit and I try to figure out this a, it's just going to absorb that j. So you don't need to worry about the j, basically. So that's why these constants are different from the constants that you would get in the, if you use the exponential form, because they absorb the fact that your linear combination of the two might be different. Yeah, go ahead. You have to use initial conditions, basically. Um, so in any given circuit, you need the, so if for this particular circuit, you need to know what the voltage is and its derivative at a given time step, or the voltage across the capacitor and the current um at a given time point if you don't then you can't really find those constants any other questions cool so that's kind of the form of the homogeneous the homogeneous solution of our lc circuit will always be of this form and the omega or the roots of the characteristic polynomial will always be like this for an lc circuit so that's kind of the lc circuit um, and so here I kind of rewrite what I just wrote in the previous slide, and we went over this previous lecture. This is just to kind of... Okay, so let's look at an example LC circuit. So let's just say that for now that the um, voltage across the capacitor is equal to one, and the voltage across the... the derivative of the voltage across the capacitor is two, and the inductance is one half and the capacitance is one half ferret. So how do we find V particular? Oh, well, and Vn is equal to zero. Yeah. So let's take this out. Yeah, so let's just say we have the equation. So basically, because we, we found that in the previous slide. So we have V in, so T equals, so that's the correct answer, but yeah. L C E D T squared squared V C sub T plus V C sub T. Yeah, so we have the equation. So once we have, go ahead. And make a guess. Yeah, so we're going to guess that V C P sub T equals zero times some constant. So as I result, BCP is equal to 
Yeah, so it's a homogeneous equation in this case because V ends of T equals zero. So it's kind of a trick question, but go ahead. Why do we say we're guessing when V C T is is uh, the value of V in amongst the digits? Is it not? What happened? Sorry. Uh, when we guess for V C T, as usually, yeah, like say so we did it with R C or parallel circuits, uh, we always guess the value of V in and its derivatives. Isn't that true? Yeah, yeah. We always address uh, guess that, and that's just basically how we're teaching you how to solve the circuits. Because later we're gonna go over different techniques. So we're choosing we're choosing sources that where this will work, but this is actually not a very good technique. Any questions about it? Okay. So, all right. So we only need to solve the homogeneous solution. So maybe I should backtrack because uh, yeah. So how do we find V homogeneous? So. Go ahead. Uh, we're just going to use like that character equation with the constants and use the initial values to find constants. Yeah, so we have the characteristic equation, which is lambda squared LC plus one equals zero, which tells us that lambda equals uh, J one over the square root of plus minus LC, which is equal to two, right? Uh, one half times one half, the square root of that is just one half, and then. So I plugged in one half for this, because that's what they gave us in one half. So we have one over two times one over two, but then the square root cancels out one of the one halves. And then you just go ahead. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so now we know what the roots are. And since they're imaginary, our homogeneous solution will have to be of the form A sine cosine. So basically we have A sine 2t plus b cosine 2t is equal to uh, vc sub t. And then to find the derivative, we can just take the derivative of this expression, vc sub t, <coughs> the derivative of sine is cosine, hopefully, cosine 2t, and the derivative is negative sine sine 2t, and then there should be a 2 and a 2. So I just took the, oh, sorry, b, b, t. So I just took the derivative of this expression to get to, uh, to get the derivative. So now how do we find the a and b? Does anyone know? Yeah, so we know that at time equals zero, uh, the voltage has to be equal to one and the derivative has to be equal to two. And so, and unlike you, I can just erase the number. So I'm just gonna, I can just plug in zero for this, plug in zero for this and plug in zero for this. And that's gonna give me one. So if I plug in zero for this, sine of zero is just zero. And then cosine of zero is just one. So I get that B equals one. So now I know what B is. And then if I plug in a zero for this, zero for this, and zero for this, then I'm gonna get, uh, well, the, the, the time equals zero, this should all be equal to two. Um, the cosine is just one, so this is just two A. And then I have uh, the sine equals zero. So I have that two A equals two. And so we get that A equals one. And that's uh, our solution basically. So here I kind of wrote it more cleanly. So here's our initial get, uh, our initial voltage with the constants. Then you take the derivative and then you plug in initial conditions to get your two equations. 
and then you have your final solution, which you just plugged in the values for A1 and A2. And in my previous slides, I used A and B. Is this clear? Yeah, so now you found the solution. So you just solved uh, the LC circuit. So you should expect to be able to, you, you should be able to solve any like RL LC circuit basically. Uh, so you should be able to apply this step. So that's kind of like the first two weeks goal. If you can do that, you're in good shape. Okay, so now we're gonna switch things up a little bit, make it a little more interesting. We're gonna turn on our little circuit, put on a source. So now how do we find a B particular? Yeah, so we make a guess. So we basically V ins of T equals uh, V ins of T equals a constant times E to the negative T. Then what do we have to do? We have to plug it into our, well, V ins of T equals LC D D T squared squared V C plus V C. So we have to uh, plug this into our, sorry, this is VCP, um, our differential equation. So when we take the second derivative of this, we're gonna get negative times a negative, which is just one. So we actually get that, uh, oh, and I'm gonna call this constant C1 just because, uh, or CP just because we already have the C here. So we will have that E to the negative T, which is V in, equals one half, one half times constant e to the negative t plus constant times e to the negative t. And so can anyone tell me what the, uh, or, sorry, cp. Can anyone tell me what cp is? So since the e to the negative t is common to all of them, I can just cancel it out. So this becomes one. So I get that uh, one plus one equals one over four plus one CP. Um, and so that's, uh, so what is uh, CP? Yeah, uh, four fifths, four over five equals CP. Yeah. Oh. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's five. Uh, the previous one was one half, I think, or was it? <laughs> Wait, did I just? Yeah, the previous one was one half, and I just thought it was the same. <laughs> yeah, one over five. Okay, so cool. So now we have the inhomogeneous solution. And so now, since this is the same circuit as before, we know that our V homogeneous of T is of the form a constant times sine omega t plus b cosine omega t. So we don't really need to solve it again. And then omega is actually one over the square root of LC, which is one over two. So now how do we find our homogeneous solution? So we just need to find the constants and to do that, we use our initial conditions, which are that BC at zero equals one. Okay, so they're the same as before. BC at zero equals one, and this BCDT equals zero. So BC is at zero equals one, and we have that BDT, BC is at zero equals two. So now we just basically plug in our initial condition, um, and then we can solve for the two coefficients. Because I'm running short on time, I'm not gonna go over it, but basically here you have what I wrote in the previous slide. And then I took the derivative 
And now all you have to do is just basically match the initial condition. Wait, what? Uh, oh, okay. So these initial conditions should be zero and zero according to my solution there. So that's why there's a zero here. So when you plug that in, then you get negative one fifth. And then when you plug that in here, you get two fifths you need to fix that. Okay. Okay. Um, are there any questions about this whole process? Can anyone execute this pretty well? Okay. So now we can briefly talk about the inhomogeneous solution. So actually, this is the way the solution would look for the for the uh, capacitor. So what's very interesting here is that our input, right, decays to zero as time goes to infinity because it's a decaying exponential. But what you actually see is that the waveform goes on and on and on and on and on and on. So this system actually behaves a lot like a pendulum, like you just I go the pendulum and it goes and the voltage actually is analogous to the height of that pendulum at any given time so the height just continues to go up and down up and down now if any of you have played with a pendulum in real life it eventually slows down uh so this is actually an idealization it, it's, it's the same thing with a circuit no circuit will uh continue to go on and on and on and on. Uh, it will decay slightly and it will eventually go to zero. It's just gonna take a long time. That's because there's no such thing as an LC circuit. All components have some resistance associated with them. Um, it's just that uh, if it, that resistance is small enough, we can approximate it as not having a resistance. But now we're gonna actually add a resistor to our circuit. And now we're gonna actually look at more realistic examples. Yeah, so that's kind of the, yeah. So we can think of the voltage as the height of the pendulum and the time evolution is just, are you all feeling sleepy? No, just go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we had our initial condition is zero and our derivative is zero. That's why you can tell that this derivative and then it. So I just plotted this basically. That's that's all I did. Okay, so now let's look at RLC circuits really quick. So in particular, RLC circuits are what we call general second order circuits. So you already actually saw your first second order circuit because that LC circuit has a second order derivative. RLC circuits have kind of a response that is also a second order differential equation. Um, and in particular, there's two configurations of RLC circuits. They're either in series or they're in parallel. Um, because this is a second order circuit, it will have three different kinds of res possible responses. One we call critically damped, which means that the two roots of our characteristic equation are the same. And the characteristic response will look something like this of your circuit. Over damped, your solution will look basically like a uh, decaying exponential. And then you have kind of a in between what you have is underdamped, where it behaves like an os oscillation. Just as a, I guess, a, 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 a difficult question, which one of these circuits, if, these, if I told you these were responses to circuits, which one would you expect the resistance is the least uh, important for? Yeah, exactly. So as you move down, this behaves more like an LC circuit. And actually, well, this behaves the most like an RCRL. And this is uh, a transition point. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. OK, so I'm going to try to get, rid of, get through this. And then next lecture, we'll look at the parallel. 
Okay, so to find a differential equation for a serious RLC, we just we can just do our loop. So we have that Vn equals Vr plus Vl plus Vc. Um, and let's just say that we want to, well, so we want to find Vc. So from the previous slides, we know that uh, uh, Vl equals L D D T of I L, and then we know that I L equals I C, which equals C D D T of V C. Um, and so now we have V C. And uh, yeah, so oh yeah, and we also know that I R equals I L. So V in sub T. In terms of I L, what what is V in sub what is V R? Just yeah, so it's just R times I L, and then we have plus L D D T of I L plus uh, V C. And then we can just plug in for IL. We can just plug this in and then we're gonna get our differential equation. So we're gonna get that this is R D D T V C plus oh R C L C D D T of I L plus VC, and this should be VC, sorry. And then this should be a second order derivative. So is it clear to everyone? Uh, so one thing to note here is if R, right, for some magic reason becomes zero, this term disappears and you're left with your LC circuit. Is that clear to everyone? <clears throat> Go ahead. Can you explain one more time how you got from that second to last slide to the last one? Did you say the derivative? The what? Sorry. Uh, are you saying the derivative from that oh. second to last slide to the bottom line? So here we said that uh, IC was equal to IL and it's equal to this. So I just substituted that. Go ahead. The equations between the variables like the VL equals L derivative. Um, IL and that stuff, should that be memorized or will it be on the sheet? I'll give you those, those if you want, but to be honest, if you haven't memorized it, you should probably practice it. That's my, that, that's actually like a sign you need to work because it's like a, it's like the same thing over and over again. At some point you just kind of, go ahead. Uh, I'm gonna ask a similar question, but um, because there's like different substitutions you can make, whether it's like the current across the inductor or something, is there like one very cut way to solve all of them, solve the problems, or is there multiple ways to solve them, or is it one fastest way? I think you can watch my video uh, that I posted online on how to derive DFQs. In general, I think practice so typically you know you you know you want to end up with vc so you want to write all your things in terms of vc and then once you have those all in front of you you're like okay let's plug in everything so that the whole equation has vc so your first step would be to get an equation where the only thing that is there is is vc and hopefully at that point you have a differential equation if you don't you take the derivative of the whole equation uh i think that says much of a strategy that I can give you. Okay, so we have our, our what do you call this? Our circuit. And now that we have our circuit, we can find our characteristic equation by simply taking, replacing the, so here I just took the equation and I divided it by LC to write it in this form. And then I found the characteristic equation for this, which is just basically that lambda squared 
R over L lambda plus LC has to be equal to zero. And then you can plug this into your quadratic formula to get uh, the value of your lambda. Yeah, so that's basically the homogeneous solution. So what's the next slide? Okay, yeah, so this is good. So depend, like I said in the previous slides, uh, and this is kind of the one thing that really changes from going from RC to RL. I mean, the equation of course now has a second order derivative, but the only thing that really changes in your process is that instead of having one root, now you have two roots, which means your homogeneous solution has two terms. That, other than that, it's all the same. So because we have two roots, that means that there's different possibilities for our roots. They could either be the same as I said in that earlier slide. And if they are the same, then you need to, your homogeneous solution will be of this form where you have a constant times your root plus another constant times time times your root. If you, uh, If you have distinct roots, but both of them are real, so there's no J's, um, then you will basically have a homogeneous solution that's just a constant, your first root, then a constant, your second root. And then you have a third case, which is that uh, if your roots are complex conjugates, or if your roots are just complex, they're always gonna be conjugates of each other. So your roots will always be of the form, we'll have an, a real part, which will be equal to uh, whatever the real part of that lambda is. And in the RLC circuit in series is this. And the uh, plus or minus J omega, then your solution will be of this form where there's a decaying exponential outside. And then in parentheses, there are your sine and cosine with two constants, and we call this the underdamp solution. So like I said in the earlier slide, we have a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor in series. And what you see here is that the decay, how strong this decay is, is actually proportional to how big this resistance is. So bigger resistance, bigger decay. So the faster your circuit will decay. Um, the bigger that L and the product of LC is, or the smaller that the product of LC is, the more oscillatory your solution is. So it's important you kind of understand that, that uh, as you change this, uh, resistance, these are, uh, your thing kind of defaults back into an RC if you have very high resistance or an RL type solution. And if you have a uh, low resistance for a series RLC, you have sines and cosines. All right, so now we have the parallel RLC and I'm gonna actually start going over this because we have time, but Next class, we'll conclude this, or should we? Actually, we'll skip this and then let's just go over this. Um, and then next class, I'll go over parallel. Okay, so where do the lambda sit if the circuit is over damped? Does anyone know? Uh, on a complex plane. Yeah, so they sit in the real axis and they're they're gonna be imaginary because these circuits will always have a response that decays. So they're always gonna be in the negative side of the complex plane. So if you see your roots somewhere here, this would be over damped. What's special if they are critically damped? Yeah, so you would basically have both of them, two roots, when they are critically damped. And then uh, what about when they are uh, 
when you have an LC circuit, where would you expect the roots to show up in this plane? Yeah, so they're the whenever you have an LC circuit with no resistance, they should sit in the Y axis because the roots are purely imaginary. And because they're uh this is kind of a one over the square root of LC. This is negative one over the square root of LC. So this is uh on damped. And this is the LC circuit. And then uh when you uh da -da 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 -da. What is it? Yeah, what happens when you have underdamped? Yeah. Yeah, so they're going to sit somewhere else in the plane, but note that the roots are always of the form uh, plus minus the square root of something negative. Something negative. And then here you're going to have something real, basically, some number. And so these are complex conjugates, so they're going to sit at the same height uh, relative to e each other. So here, let me just get another color. Right, right. So this is uh, on their damped. So in previous semesters, people used to call a figure that looked like this, the, the circle of uh, death, uh, because it appeared three times on, on an exam. And I think all three times, like 10% of the students got the question right or less. <laughs> but anyway, one thing to note <laughs> is that when you look at these uh, in particular, the the distance between these for both parallel and series RLC, the that this length will actually be always be one over the square root of LC. So kind of these things actually sit on a circle. In the uh, just that's just uh, something that happens. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's a. Uh, Basically, so it doesn't matter whether the circuit is parallel or series, the two roots, the distance between the origin and the two roots will always be one over the square root of LC. Yeah, so this is what people call the, the circle of that. So as you take a circuit and you add resistance in series, you're basically moving along this circle so basically, I start with, let's say for my RLC, I uh, add resistance, so bigger. I move down the circle. Once I get here, what ends up happening is that, uh, so as I keep, once I get here, as I keep increasing resistance, what will happen is that the roots will start to space out. So this is kind of no resistance. Little resistance, middle, large, large. Just kind of like it goes around the circle and then it gets there. It, it's kind of like, like a car crash. You're driving down the road. <laughs> then you hit you hit a wall and then like half the car goes this way and the other car, half the car goes that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's series RLC. Next class, we'll talk about parallel RC. We'll do an example, and then we'll do our quiz. So, yeah.